a perpetual traveler through the Bible. Please join me for the next part of my journey through the scriptures. Stay as long as you like and let us together discover a bit more about the Bible. The second coming of Jesus Christ is a major theme of scripture. In the Old Testament, in Daniel 7 verses 13, Jesus is referred to as the coming one. Nine times in the book of Revelation, Jesus Christ is called the coming one. This is the heart of the book of Revelation. It is the climax of God's redemption of the human race. It is every believer's final destination. Recently, I read an article penned by John MacArthur in which he states the following. One-fifth of all scripture is focused on prophecy, and one-third of that focuses on the second coming. There are over 650 prophecies in scripture, and half of them focus on Christ. 225 of those prophecies point to his second coming. There are over 1,500 passages in the Bible that refer to the second coming, so this is actually one out of every 25 verses in the Bible. Over 50 times in the New Testament we are told to be ready for his return. So, Scripture tells us that we can be sure that Jesus is coming again. God has promised it, Jesus' own words confirm it, and the presence of the Holy Spirit in the believer's life guarantees it. One of the most breathtaking passages on the second coming is Revelation chapter 5. This looks at the second coming from heaven's vantage point. Here we meet the conqueror of the world as he is about to take over the universe, to redeem it, to destroy the wicked, and to establish and bless his people. In episode 29 of the Journey Through the Scriptures podcast, we studied the first few verses of Revelation chapter 5, where John was introduced to the seven-sealed scroll and the lion who looked like a lamb. John was told by one of the 24 angelic elders surrounding the throne of God that Jesus was the only being in heaven and earth to be worthy to open the sealed scroll. The response in heaven to Jesus being revealed as the only one worthy of taking the scroll is found in Revelation 5 verses 8 to 10. And when he had taken the scroll, the four living creatures and the twenty-four elders fell down before the Lamb, each holding a harp and golden bowls full of incense, which are the prayers of the saints. And they sang a new song, saying, Worthy are you to take the scroll and to open its seals, for you were slain, and by your blood you ransomed people for God, from every tribe and language and people and nation, and you have made them a kingdom and priest to our God, and they shall reign on the earth. This is the worship of heaven. All the beings in heaven understand the meaning of history and God's program for redemption. Each of these heavenly beings has a harp and bowls of incense, which we are told are the prayers of the saints. The slain lamb is the center of their worship. The harp symbolizes the music of creation. In the same way the strings of a harp vibrate in harmony, so the whole of creation also vibrates in the harmonious worship of God. Every part of creation fulfills the intention which God had for it since the beginning. Even inanimate objects like stars, stones, trees, flowers and water all give Him praise. Nature worships whenever any part of nature fulfills the intention God had created it for. Nature always gives praise and glory to God its creator. For instance, look at a flower closely and see how you can marvel at the beauty and complexity of its design, conceived and executed by the power and wisdom of God. All of nature is as amazing as that flower, and looking at and appreciating nature should lead us to worship and praise God. The twenty-four elders also hold the prayers of the saints. We should feel encouraged that heaven understands that believers also contribute to the work of redemption. Although we cannot lay the foundation because Jesus has done that perfectly already, we share in the application of it throughout the earth. Paul writes about this in 1 Timothy 2 verses 1 and 1 Timothy 2 verses 4 where he says, First of all, then, I urge that supplications, prayers, intercessions, and thanksgivings be made for all people. This is good, and it is pleasing in the sight of God our Saviour, who desires all people to be saved and to come to the knowledge of the truth. 
Do we really understand the power of our prayers? Prayers put the work of redemption into action, and prayers are part of the program of God. This is what prayer does. Whenever we care about another person, and we bring that person before God in prayer, we become part of the process of applying God's work of redemption to that human heart. We are actually becoming a partner with God in changing and redeeming lives. The fact that we can become part of God's eternal program for human redemption should encourage us and transform our prayer lives. In Revelation 5 verses 9, John says something very strange. The twenty-four elders and the four living creatures sing a new song. The twenty-four elders and the four living creatures around the throne are singing a song that is new to them, because, as angelic beings, they have never been redeemed. They have had to learn about redemption by watching God's grace affecting sinners. We are all willful, rebellious, wicked men and women who want their own way and whom, nevertheless, God calls. He forgives them, restores them, and saves them. This is the song the angels have learned from the saints. Remember what the Apostle Peter says in 1 Peter 1 verses 18 to 19. Knowing that you were ransomed from the futile ways inherited from your forefathers, not with perishable things such as silver or gold, but with the precious blood of Christ, like that of a lamb without blemish or spot. As John watches, all the universe is caught up in the wonder of God's sacrificial love for mankind. John hears a great swelling chorus, the voices of millions of angels. Revelation 5 verses 11 to 14 describes this scene. Then I looked, and I heard around the throne and the living creatures and the elders the voice of many angels, numbering myriads of myriads of thousands of thousands, saying with a loud voice, Worthy is the Lamb who was slain to receive power and wealth and wisdom and might and honor and glory and blessing. And I heard every creature in heaven and on earth and under the earth and in the sea and all that is in them saying, To him who sits on the throne and to the Lamb be blessing and honor and glory and might for ever and ever. And the four living creatures said, Amen. And the elders fell down and worshipped. In Paul's letter to the Philippians, he refers to this same scene. Paul encourages the readers to imitate the humility of Christ, who willingly took the form of a servant, humbled himself, and died for our sakes, and then says in chapter 2, verses 9 to 11, Therefore God has highly exalted him, and bestowed on him the name that is above every name, so that at the name of Jesus every knee should bow, in heaven, and on earth, and under the earth and every tongue confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. Paul mentions divisions here, heaven, earth, and under the earth. These are identical to the divisions that John sees in his vision. In each of these realms, there is the sound of praise and worship offered to Jesus the Redeemer. Those under the earth refers to those who have already died, including those who die in unbelief and are in hell. Even hell will have to join with heaven and earth in acknowledging the Lordship of Jesus Christ. Believers will gladly confess that Jesus Christ is Lord because they have understood and accepted the death of Jesus for themselves. Others will only reluctantly acknowledge that He is indeed Lord. Today, there are many people who scoff at the Scriptures, who ridicule the Bible, and rebel against God's moral standards. They will have to at last admit that they are wrong that they have followed an illusion, and their life has been wasted, and along with all creation be forced to acknowledge the Lordship of Christ. Of course John sees this in the vision, so it has not yet occurred on earth, but it will happen some day. When the seven-sealed scroll is finally opened, heaven and earth will join in this acknowledgement, because this is the final goal of all history. Every historic event that occurs and every day that passes is linked to that moment that John witnesses in Revelation 5. All the important events that we see happening around the world in the news do not take place in a vacuum. They are all part of God's grand and eternal plan. We are all part of that plan as well. 
We all have choices to make and we cannot escape the eternal consequences of those choices. Some day every knee shall bow and every tongue shall confess that Jesus Christ is Lord. There will be no exceptions. You will confess his lordship and so will I. So the question is, which group will you be in? Will we stand with those who gladly confess the lordship of Jesus or will we be with those who reluctantly acknowledge that he is right and they are wrong? Only you can answer that question. The next chapter, chapter 6, starts to deal with the opening of the first four seals of the scroll. I don't know if you have ever noticed, but often before a storm there is a strange calm, a sense of foreboding in the air. It is almost as if the weather is holding its breath just before the violent storm is about to break. This is what we experience frequently in today's world. Deep in our minds, there might be a sense that we are teetering on the brink of a crisis in the affairs of earth. Keep in the back of your minds that the Bible has long predicted such a crisis. In the Old Testament, the book of Daniel mirrors closely the book of Revelation. Daniel saw many of the same things that John records here, although Daniel lived 500 years before John wrote the book of Revelation. In the ninth chapter of the book of Daniel, he is given a great calendar that outlines history in its final days. A period of 70 weeks of years was marked out. 70 times 7 years is 490 years. So there would be 490 years that would pass from the beginning of the building of the wall of Jerusalem in the days of Nehemiah to the end of the age. According to that prophecy, 480 of those years would end on the day when the Messiah would be presented to Israel as her king. 483 years after Nehemiah began rebuilding the walls of Jerusalem, Jesus rode down the Mount of Olives on a donkey and was presented to the nation as their king. Just a few days after this he was rejected and crucified. The prophecy of Daniel had said that the Messiah would be cut off and shall have nothing, which is a reference to the crucifixion. After that there seems to be a lengthy period of time during which Daniel was told, There shall be war and desolations are decreed. This can be found in Daniel 9 verses 26. It is during that undetermined length of time that the church comes into being, starting on the day of Pentecost when God began to call out a special people for his name, made up of both Jews and Gentiles. That church began over 2,000 years ago and it is still on earth today. Daniel is then told of certain other events that were to occur during the last seven years of that 490 year period and those events have not yet happened. Many Bible commentators agree that this seven year period is still unfulfilled and when it begins it will be largely and closely associated with the nation of Israel. In Revelation, there are three sets of seven events that occur in these last seven years. The first series is the opening of the seven seals, seven trumpets that must yet sound, and seven bowls of wrath which are to be poured out upon the earth. Each of these series of sevens divides into four events and then three events. Four of those events are visible and easy to recognize and then three events that are going on behind the scenes, in the spiritual realm. Revelation 6 verses 1 to 2 says, Now I watched when the Lamb opened one of the seven seals, and I heard one of the four living creatures say with a voice like thunder, Come! And I looked, and behold, a white horse, and its rider had a bow, and a crown was given to him, and he came out conquering, and to conquer. What does his rider on the white horse represent? Many people identify him as Jesus, because in Revelation 19, Jesus appears on a white horse wearing a crown. The crown given to this rider on the white horse is a different kind of crown. The Greek word used here is Stephanos, which describes a wreath given as a prize in public games or a symbol of honor. The crowns that Jesus is described as wearing in chapter 19 are diadems, or combined crowns, and not the Stephanos wreath. It is a mistake to confuse these two because the context is entirely different. 
In chapter 6, we are looking at the beginning of the judgments of God, and in chapter 19, we see the end of them. Secondly, the rider of chapter 6 is summoned by one of the living creatures, but it would be unthinkable for a creature to summon the conquering Christ of chapter 19. It is significant that this rider on the white horse does bear some resemblance to the appearance of Jesus on the great white horse in chapter 19. They both ride a white horse, they both wear crowns, and both are conquerors. It suggests that this rider is someone who is like Christ, but not Christ. My personal conviction is that this is most likely the long-predicted Antichrist that Scripture speaks of in various places, who is yet to appear in the last days. The Apostle Paul calls him the man of sin and the lawless one in 2 Thessalonians chapter 2, who still has to appear and present himself as though he were the Messiah. What does Jesus himself say to the Jewish leaders about this person? John 5 verses 43 says, I have come in my Father's name, and you do not receive me. If another comes in his own name, you will receive him. This rider on a white horse comes like Christ, but he comes in his own name. He is given a bow, but no mention is made of arrows. In other words, no weapons. It appears to be a bloodless conquest and suggests some kind of overpowering of the minds and will of men, without physical destruction, but by some form of deceit and lying that misleads and deceives men and thus conquers them without the shedding of blood. In Matthew 24 verses 4, Jesus warns his disciples about the possibility of deception. And Jesus answered them, See that no one leads you astray, for many will come in my name, saying, I am the Christ, and they will lead many astray. We are preoccupied by delusions today. We are not aware of how much we are being deceived all the time through television and media that makes false claims and promises. What the appearance of this ride on the white horse tells us, however, is that the worst is yet to come. We are in the middle of a great deceit, but it is not as bad as it is going to be. An even greater lie is coming. Paul writes about this in 2 Thessalonians 2 verses 9. The coming of the lawless one is by the activity of Satan with all power and false signs and wonders, and with all wicked deception for those who are perishing, because they refuse to love the truth and so be saved. Therefore God sends them a strong delusion, so that they may believe what is false, in order that all may be condemned who did not believe the truth but had pleasure in unrighteousness. Here we have the confirmation that in the last days, God will remove the restraints that hold back man's wickedness and will let deceit have its way among them until it reaches a climax of delusion. God's method of making man face up to the truth is by giving us what we demand, so we will see the consequences of our rebellion against God and turn to Him. In so doing, God allows evil to prevail for a while. Eventually, Wise parents know that they have to let their children make their own decisions and live with the consequences of those decisions, ultimately so that they will make better decisions. In this respect, God is also like a wise parent. God is saying to the world, if you don't want it my way, I will give you your way. Of course we will learn many more details of that in later chapters of Revelation, but it is important not to rush through this book as we might miss important details that might affect our understanding of God's plan for mankind. This is David Wiles, your fellow traveler in Christ, and this has been the Journey Through the Scriptures podcast, episode 30.